calories don't matter, hormones do. What? That sounds like a myth, and in fact it is. It's the number two fitness myth on our list weekly series. I'm Dr. Mike for Renaissance Periodization. Let's get into this one. We're going to, of course, talk about the claim, reasons that it's wrong, some grains of truth, and best practices to take away on this actual topic. So here's basically the claim, and it comes in a variety of different facets and lights. It says that hormones and your hormone levels specifically determine whether or not you gain or lose fat and muscle and gain or lose weight. Another part of the claim is that you can be hypocaloric on paper, which means you're eating at a deficit as far as you know, but if your hormones are off to some extent, you may not you may not lose fat and you may not even lose any weight. And that sure sounds mysterious, would be a very terrible thing if that was the case. Lastly, a big claim, kind of especially so, is that when you diet to lose fat or gain muscle, whatever, the primary mode of dieting, the primary goal of dieting should be to create an optimal hormonal environment and not so much creating a calorie deficit or a surplus and maybe even not worrying about those things. That's kind of how these claims sort of stack up. And let's find out where they lack. And right out of the gate, it's not good news. The law of conservation of mass energy, which has never been disproven and has been proven true by good God knows how many experiments at this point, all the way down to even the quantum level, basically says that you have to have energy and or mass coming into a system to maintain that system's total energy and mass if you have stuff leaking out, that when you conduct your regular daily physical activity, you literally expend energy, and if you don't actually correct for that with somehow bringing energy in, you absolutely will lose mass because macromolecules are being broken down for energy, and then they're just not there anymore. You literally breathe out a bunch of carbon dioxide and water that literally used to be molecules of food you took in. So if we reduce the food, and that's all measured by calories, then – you know, good God, you still need to actually have your body function. It's going to start to break down its own molecules and you have to lose weight. If this wasn't true, how the fuck do people even die in a famine? I mean, hunger used to kill millions and millions of people all the time, less and less so, almost no famine in the world today, which is amazing. But back in the day, like even 10 years ago, famines were a regular thing. And, you know, can you imagine going down to like a South American like food insecure place and, you know, people are just don't have enough to eat. And you're like, it's the hormones, huh? Would you guys figure out how to boost your test or whatever? Losing all this crazy weight. They're like, we don't have any fucking food. And you'd be like, what do you mean? You should be all fat and bloated because I, when I did a thousand calorie diet, it messed up my hormones and I blew up like crazy. Like, no, no. You blew up when you stopped the thousand calorie diet and started eating everything in sight. So at the end of the day, calorie balance has to matter from a physics perspective. And there's no way around this. It's just a real thing. Now, you can say, okay, well, yeah, physics is cool and famines or whatever, but has this ever actually measured in people? Has this been measured in people? Yes. There are these studies called metabolic ward studies where they take people and they literally make them, not make them, it's all voluntary folks. They, they sign a document and they get to stay essentially in a hospital or in a, a wing of a, an institution. They live there. They sleep there. Sometimes they exercise there. They are fed an exact known diet, known uh, um, uh, uh, sort of allotment of nutrients in that diet, known calories. And then oftentimes their physical activity is tracked down to the five calorie level even to go as far as to measure the total heat generated inside the room they live in, which gives a real good proxy for how many calories they're burning. So those studies have been done numerous, numerous times. What they find is no matter what people's hormones are, no matter what their macro distributions are, they lose a very predictable amount of weight when you generate a calorie deficit any way that you do it. Okay? And if you generate a surplus, people tend to gain weight. It's a thing. Now, sometimes you generate a surplus from food, but the body raises its average body temperature and average activity level, so the true surplus at the tissue level is gone. Sometimes, when you eat very little food, your body becomes so, so much colder, a few degrees colder, and less active, and then you actually burn fewer calories. So you were at 2,000 calories, you were losing no weight. You take it down to 1,500, and in some strange cases, very unusual, people's metabolisms will adjust all the way down. This feels like total shit, by the way. 
1,500, and then you're not burning any more fat and you're not losing weight. That is not a violation of calorie balance because we're not considering the calories outside. If the calories out outside of the equation actually reduces as well, then you're still at calorie balance. But here's the thing. How many people believe that if you drop calories down to zero, your metabolism is going to go down to zero? I tell you what, it will eventually when you fucking die of starvation. This is not a thing that happens with no boundaries. At some point, calorie balance will adjust itself. It will result in a deficit and you will lose weight if you eat very, very little food, right? Now, another few reasons why it's wrong. People will say, well, if my hormones are off, my cortisol is too high, I stop losing fat. That only really tends to happen if your stress response makes you overeat, which a lot of people's stress response does. Other people, the way they respond to stress, and I'm sure you know some folks like that, is they stop eating or they don't eat or they eat less. Cortisol generally is a stress hormone, it's a fight or flight hormone, it actually makes you lose weight and fat like crazy. Unfortunately, it also makes you lose muscle, but cortisol is not this like fat building hormone. If you had a group of people, like, let's do this stupid alien analogy, aliens come to earth and they say, look, these five randomly selected people have one year to gain 100 pounds each of fat, and if they don't, we're shooting the earth and it blows up men in black style. Well, if we actually do that, and you say, okay, what are the most powerful tools we have to get each of these people to gain 100 pounds of fat in the next year? Nobody in their right mind is going to be like, just shoot them up with cortisol, man. They're going to blow up like crazy. Uh-uh, because half of them are going to lose a bunch of weight. You know, another third of them aren't going to do anything. And then some people will have a stress response and eat more. There's way better ways to gain fat than cortisol. It's not a predictable way to lead to fat gain. So a lot of times people say, well, it's all good and well, but with calories going low, cortisol goes up and that's bad. Sometimes but not all the time and not even the majority of the time. Lastly, another thing that's very wrong about this approach is the claim or the belief that insulin is uniquely adipogenic, that it is very much a molecule that causes lots of fat storage. Well, it also causes lots of glycogen storage. It also causes lots of muscle growth. It does all kinds of stuff. And if you take in pure fat, like for example, you just eat butter or drink cream, that sounds pretty tasty. I don't know about the eating butter part. Drinking cream may be better. If you do that, you actually get no insulin response whatsoever, but guess what? You put on a crap load of fat because you're literally introducing fat. So yes, insulin is adipogenic to some extent in a hypercaloric circumstance, but by itself in normal situations, it can't make you eat any more calories. Some people will take this to the next level sort of accurately and say, well, if you have a diet which elevates your insulin a lot, your hunger is going to be higher. It turns out that's actually not true. Multiple studies show that uh, insulin's presence in the bloodstream actually reduces hunger, and insulin only really increases hunger almost exclusively in exogenous delivery mechanisms. So if you shoot insulin into your body much more than your body makes, you get resultant hypoglycemia, blood sugar falls because insulin shuttles it all to the, the cells, and there's very little left in the blood, then you will have a rebound high hunger effect. But normally, insulin does not cause a lot of hunger. How do we know this? Well, direct studies and also... Uh, excessively insulinergic foods, foods that actually cause more of an insulin secretion than you would expect based on their carb levels, include milk and yogurt. Okay. You see people having a glass of milk and a container of yogurt and like an hour later, they're like, man, I could eat every plate of French fries in the world. No, those are actually really filling foods. So the whole idea that insulin makes me super hungry, it's not the insulin. It's usually the fact that you eat really tasty foods like potato chips they have some insulin response, although not a high one because their fat intake blunts the insulin response. What ends up happening is they just taste so good you want more of them. That's totally a thing that happens, but insulin is not this unique uh, hormone that either puts on a ton of fat and certainly not in a calorically controlled environment. Second of all, it doesn't predictably even raise your hunger levels, so that's not a thing. I used to think it was a thing many years ago, not that many actually, and it's just not, right? So, so the hormone thing really does start to fall apart. Now, it's not without, of course, its grains of truth. For example, if your testosterone is low, then when and if you try to gain weight, you'll put on mostly fat and not a whole lot of muscle. If your testosterone is low when you're losing weight, you'll lose a bunch of muscle and you will lose fat as well, but you lose a lot of muscle and it's really painful and you lose your strength and all this other stuff. If your estrogen is ultra, ultra low for some reason, a lot of times this interferes with your ability to think clearly, short-term memory, it interferes with recovery and you get very poor energy, like showing up to the gym with zero estrogen is like, I don't even know why the hell I'm here. Who am I anyway? And it can interfere significantly with your sleep, which is really, really bad and not sustainable at all. 
if your estrogen is way too high, then you can probably put fat on more easily than muscle versus what you used to with normal estrogen. So definitely some concerns there. And of course, chronically elevated insulin levels are bad for your body composition and for your health, but generally they only occur in either disease states, like someone has type 2 diabetes, or someone who's intentionally hypercalorically dieting. That hypercaloric dieting is a big, big thing because people are saying it's calories versus hormones. It's not. If you do the calories part wrong, which is to say going hypercaloric when you're trying to lose weight, then all the kind of wrong hormones follow as well. If you reduce your calories marginally, slowly, not excessively, most of the hormones do normal stuff, kind of the right stuff, and the calorie deficit is what drives the fat loss. So we kind of view hormones more in the sense of things that modify and allow and expand your ability to lose muscle and fat. They're not the key drivers of it. The calorie surplus or deficit is the key driver of both muscle and weight gain and fat and weight loss. Full stop, period. Hormones can modify them a little bit, but they're not more important and than, they are less important than calories. Really, really big thing to understand. Where does that leave us? What are the best practices? First, if you want to lose or if you want to gain, eat in a deficit and surplus respectively and eat your meals with a core of protein and most of the stuff should be healthy, fruits, veggies, whole grains, lean meats, so on and so forth. That's key for almost every and any goal because a lot of these weird hormone diets have you eating in some weird ass way and well, you gotta eat tons of saturated fat or something like that. And if we lose the basics, then we sometimes, even if you still have a calorie deficit, it's not the healthiest diet, it's not the most muscle promoting diet. So fundamental healthy core diet with either a small deficit or a small surplus is 90% of the way there. In addition to that, you should care about your hormones because they have an effect to modify the caloric effect and get you more muscle or more fat or whatever. To the extent that you have influence on your hormones, you can do a few things. First, you want to get plenty of sleep. If you want to fuck almost every single hormone completely, just get very little sleep for multiple nights in a row. Surefire way to do it. So get plenty of sleep. Make sure you're not tired throughout the day. Don't cut any of the macros way too much than you normally would. Protein, we usually don't cut, so we're going to talk about that. If you go zero fats, your hormones suffer. If you go zero carbs, your hormones suffer. If you eat plenty of both fats and carbs, but reduce both a little bit to generate a deficit, generally your hormones stay pretty good. If you diet for too long, your hormones inevitably start weaving off into bad things. So another thing is to make sure if you're pushing a fat loss diet really hard and you're not a competitor, competitors might have to do it for a bit longer, and your fat loss diet's at roughly like 12 weeks at the most, eight to 12 is a really good number of weeks to fat loss diet in sequence, and then go back up to maintenance levels, coast for a while, another, oh, I don't know, six to 10 weeks of just letting your body recover and heal, and then go at it again. A good way to mess up your hormones is really just to diet for a very long time. And the funny thing is, a lot of people who say calorie deficits don't work, it's all hormones, will do things like dieting for you know 25 weeks on end and then starting to cheat uh, towards the end. That means they're no longer tended to calorie balance and they're dieting enough to really screw their hormones. They go to the doctor, their hormones are really uh, screwed up and they say, but I've been in a calorie deficit and it hasn't been working. They start eating healthy again. They stop trying to lose weight but they're eating healthy is actually still hypocaloric, but with filling good foods. Their hormones return to normal after a few weeks, and they start losing fat like crazy. And they're like, I knew it was hormones. Like, mm, yes, because you really screwed them up. But also you screwed them up so much, you weren't even in a caloric deficit anymore. Next point is to stay leaner and keep active if you want your insulin sensitivity to be very high. Those of you that lift weights that watch this channel, hopefully most of you, you're already doing a huge, huge benefit to your insulin sensitivity. If you stay on average more active, like, oh, something like 10,000 or more steps per day if you have a step tracker, like this little gem here. By the way, it's the MI Fit, My Fit, that people ask me what the brand is. I don't recommend it necessarily. It's fine. It's cheap. It's from China, so I'm pretty sure the Communist Party knows like how long I walk at the gym. Uh, in any case, staying leaner, staying more active, staying leaner means like when you're massing up, still see your abs or something like that. If you're getting into Java mode, that's not good for insulin stuff. Here's the funny thing about that. People take these cocktails like insulin sensitizer and these pills and these potions and these weird food combinations like, oh, I don't have any carbs anymore because they're bad for my insulin sensitivity. I fast for insulin sensitivity. The number one thing that gives you insulin sensitivity is being very muscular and very lean. So if you have like abs and veins in your abs, 
you are so insulin sensitive, it's insane. Stay leaner, be more active, eat healthy, and then your insulin sensitivity will almost certainly be fine, right? Lastly, big point, special diets, pills, hormone boosters like testosterone boosters, they really just don't do anything or much at all. Don't waste your time on these. Get your calories set, get your sleep, have everything in balance. Don't diet or train without a deload or, or, or rest break for too long. And all the stuff really sorts itself. If you want hormonal manipulation, that's something really only the doctor can prescribe you. And by doctor, I mean dealer. And by prescribe, I mean sell. That last part's a joke. See you next time.